Um, hi, thank you so much for coming. I know it's cold and it's early and I really, really appreciate it. I was excited that there's new people here. Um, when Yulia last year said, hey, for the one year anniversary, we're gonna talk about anxiety. Do you wanna talk about it? I, and the people I was standing with sort of laughed out loud. Um, so I thought, oh, how appropriate, <laughs> considering who I am. Um, and yeah, so uh, I have suffered from anxiety pretty much my whole life, um, which I thought I had totally like mastered and was super cool and chill, but clearly there's still something about me that says, you know, tap this girl, she can figure it out and talk about anxiety better than most. Um, my family uh, was blessed to sort of deal with anxiety always and white knuckle it. Um, so there was that element for me, but there was also the fact that I, um, I suffer from PTSD. Um, I'm, gonna, I'm anxious and nervous, so I'm gonna refer back to my notes a little bit. Um, and you know, when I was talking to Yulia about what she wanted from me in terms of discussing this, what she said to me was uh, very freeing and nerve wracking. She said, you know, just tell your story tell my own personal experience. Um, so that's what I'm gonna do. Uh, I grew up in Oregon in a very small town with very few people um, and sort of went out into the world and some not so great things happened to me. Um, I have been attacked twice in my life. Um, the first time I was 13 and it was a group of young boys and it was in the afternoon um, and it was pretty brutal. It was pretty brutal. The second time I was 18 um, and it was I think 3.30 or 4 in the afternoon and I had just finished classes on a community college campus and had gotten a smoothie from Smoothie King that I was drinking um, and it just came out of nowhere. And I was very, very lucky in that way in terms of it being in a public place where both times the first time it was a woman that I barely knew, who I thought I irritated the hell out of and didn't like me, who came to my aid. And the second time, um, it was extremely fortuitous and uh, basketball practice had just gotten out. And there were a group of very, very brave young men that came to my aid um, and helped me and called the police. So I feel very grateful and blessed for those people that, you know, stepped up and did something for me when I couldn't do something for myself. Um, and I wanna, you know, obviously this is a huge topic now. When we had first approached anxiety a year ago, the culture was very different, or it appeared very different in this country. And you know, that facade of safety for men and women and minorities and the LGBT community has really crumbled profoundly. And people are talking now, there's the Me Too movement, um, you know, there's a lot going on in this country now where this is coming to the forefront. So for me, when I thought about, you know, at first I was like, oh, I'll talk about all the meditation I do and the yoga and gardening and, you know, all this other stuff. And I thought, no, I'm going to talk about what, what is actually going on and where a lot of people in this world's anxiety comes from and, and women specifically, right? Because that's my experience and I can only talk from my experience. Um, I want to give some statistics about where, where this really lies in our culture and how prevalent it really is. Um, so one in three women are going to be victims of sexual or physical assault at some point in this world. And to me that seemed pretty small, um, but you know, that, that's what they are, so that's what I'm going to say. Um, one in ten women have experienced cyber harassment, which is another, you know, a form of verbal written assault. I'm assuming that out of that one in ten, the other nine just didn't have internet. Um, <laughs> that's what I'm going to go with there. Uh, and 23% of female undergraduate women have experienced some sort of sexual misconduct or assault on a college campus. Um, and obviously those are, the, those are the women that told the truth, right? We walk around in this world and we try and look like we have our stuff together. I'm going to try really hard not to use profanity. So if you see me pause for a second, congratulate me a little bit that I kept it clean. Um, 
you know, we walk around and I try, you know, with the business and in my life, I try to act like I have my act together. And I do for the most part now. I've worked really hard to make peace and, and sort of move past the stuff that's happened to me. Um, but, but you never know, you know, I, um, I read the other day that the people who most likely need help often don't look like they need help. And I think that's really the case. And I think we really need to be aware of each other and, and sort of how we move through the world and how we, you know, grocery shop and go to the mall and interact with mothers and, and, and understand that those anxieties are something all of us, or most of us, do have. Um, you know, the rates of, of these acts being reported to officials is between 5 and 28 percent. So, so there are very few people that are actually going to reach out or acknowledge it. Many people, this was not my case, but many people experience these things and then just try and move on with their lives and pretend it didn't happen and, and are treated as though, you know, they haven't had the experiences that they have and that they haven't had the scars that they carry. Um, I also thought it was interesting that less than 10% of those people that experience such traumas are going to seek help from law enforcement. We talk a lot about, you know, what's the government's job and, and, and a city's job. And the reality is, in the end, those aren't the people that are going to help and protect us, right? The police are not on every corner. And if they are, often that's not why they're around, um, you know, to protect a woman who just got harassed or, or violated is not always their primary concern, especially in the culture we're in. Um, so I was, you know, my experience is unique in that I did have a law enforcement involved and they were actually, for me, extremely helpful. Obviously, I'm a white woman, right? And I was young and I was in a place that everyone felt something like that shouldn't happen, so I wasn't questioned that way. Um, and I had witnesses, so no one relied on my spotty, traumatized, shocked account, um, which, is, which we also see is not the case in this country. Often women in their recollections are questioned and torn apart. Um, and I, you know, justice was served for me for the most part. Um, I was spared a lot. I have a lot of gratitude for how my experience unfolded. Um, the man who attacked me when I was 18 actually pled guilty the morning of the trial. <clears throat> so I did not have to go in there and sit and have my questionable choices as a young woman, or my integrity, or my memory, or my involvement um, thoroughly excavated. So, so I feel very lucky in that way and have a, feel like I have a profound responsibility to all the people that don't have such a unique circumstance. Um, so while I can establish that the tragedy of violence happens everywhere, I can only you know, speak to the ramifications of my own experience. And for years, years, you know, it's been 17 years now, I walked in fear everywhere and was anxious all the time. I felt afraid at the park with my children when I went to yoga, going in and out of my car. Um, I mean, going to the mailbox in the beginning was scary for me after this. So, you know, I've written about this before and I've spoken about it before and um, it's been really cathartic for me to understand that, that lots of women and men and minorities, um, you know, anyone who's sort of unique and has been targeted for that in any way, share those fears and those anxieties. Um, you know, we all sit there with our guard and our antennas up waiting for the next bad thing to happen. And, and I, you know, obviously that's ironic now because of what I do. Um, I deal with hundreds of people every week. I deal with them on the farm, I see people out in public, I interact with people constantly. People I don't know come up to me and will um, feel like they know me and give me a hug and I'll hear my name called out. And, and that's an interesting thing considering where I come from and where my anxieties and my fears lie. Um, and then there's the farm, right? So we have events here on Fridays and Saturday nights. Um, and so I spend a lot of my time now around lots of people on a dimly lit farm under the stars with alcohol and music and that's an environment that once upon a time would have been extremely challenging for me. I mean if you think that I was afraid in the grocery store and at yoga, I cannot even tell you what it was like for me out in the world in the evenings. 
in the dark, in a crowded club, in a bar. I, I couldn't most of the time, and I, and I didn't. Um, and I think that's one reason that this place has become so important to me and to David and, and what we've done in that having a safe place for women to come where they can be out in the world and feel safe is truly an extraordinary thing, not just for me and, and my hot mess, but, but for all of us. We have a lot of women that come here that it, say that it's the only place they feel comfortable coming by themselves. Um, and I remember the first time I heard that, it was a woman that had come once or twice with her boyfriend. And I saw her one night by herself and I said, oh, is your, is your boyfriend coming with you? And she goes, no, he's actually out of town. But, and I wanted to go out tonight, but I was alone and I knew that this place would be okay. I knew you'd take care of me. And that was huge for me, this idea that, that, that we need a safe space, that we can go where we don't have to have five people around us in a herd making sure that everything's okay, which I think is how most of us, men and women, sort of move through the world. Um, the other thing that I want to talk about for a second is this idea, and I thought about this about myself, oh my gosh, it happened not once but twice. You know, what are the chances of that? And the reality is the chances are very, very, very high. The statistics for repeated crime against a single human being are appalling and sad. Um, if you've been assaulted once, the chances of you being assaulted again uh, double. They quadruple if it's more than two. And anything over that, they can't even, they can't even quantify. It, they, they call it tenfold. Um, and that was always a thought for me as well. And you know, most women aren't harassed once or twice. You know, it's, it's so prevalent. It's so prevalent for all of us. Um, so, you know, when we first opened up, I had this in the back of my mind, but it wasn't, I think it was for David. David thought about it a lot and moved through the world. He had been in the nightlife scene before and saw, you know, the sort of the dark parts. And he was very more aware of, of what this place could be in that form. Um, but for me, I sort of, I walked around, I took care of the people I knew and my employees, but it was more of a, a spectator sport. Um, and then there was an evening after the elections that was a real turning point for me. We had been open, I think, seven months. And there were two women outside, and there were, and there'd been a group of men that were here who really just uh, I just didn't like the feeling that I got from them and I was trying to manage it. They were hanging out by the registers too long and they were commenting on women as they walked by and I said something several times and then had David say something and I really tried to balance. It was really a dance about making sure everyone had a good time. I was worried about their experience as well, not only the experience of the people that were working for us and, and our customers. And these two women were outside, they turned out to be sisters and it was their first time here. And one of these men walked by and commented on what one of the women was, was wearing and touched her arm. And it was just like a light touch. It, it, it should have been something that, you know, when I was trying to make everyone happy, then been harmless or something I brushed off and I didn't. I turned around and I walked back to them and I said, you know, you shouldn't touch someone you don't know. And these comments are not appropriate and it needs to stop and it needs to stop now. And I remember the man was super condescending and he said, oh honey, this is just how men talk. And given what had just happened with the election where we were all raw, and the precedent that had been set by, you know, the leader of our country, you know, this is how men talk and this is locker room. I lost it. I lost my mind. And I'm going to paraphrase what I said because it is, you know, nine something in the morning. Um, but I basically said, you know, this isn't Trump land. Get in your car and go home. And he looked at me with such shock and said, well, I need to tell my friends that I'm leaving. And he had his cell phone in his hands and I said, no, you know what you can do? You can call your friends when you get in your car and they can come out and you can go home. I said, because this is my home. This is our home. 
and that does not happen here. And, and I was shaking and these two women were looking at me with their jaws dropped open like, oh my gosh, what's gonna happen next? And he listened. And I stood there while him and his buddy got in their car and they called their friends and they left. It was, you know, and I woke up the next morning and I was still thinking about it. It was a real turning point in, in me understanding that the safety of others for all of us is not a spectator sport. You know, I knew from my own life that, that people stepped in and helped and saved me and that was my job too and especially, especially here and moving out in the world. So these two girls wrote about it on Facebook the next day um, and said, we had an amazing night last night. Thanks Teal for having such a thin skin and, and we're glad we weren't in Trump land. And I really, my gut reaction was that it hurt my feelings a little bit, the thin skin part. I actually tried to find the post, but it's been, you know, it's been a while and, um, and I was nervous about it being up. We sort of talked about, you know, do we delete it or do we not, or, you know, it's political. And, and we thought, no, this is who we are. Um, but as I went on to think about the thin skin comment, I realized that that was okay. That, that having a thick skin when it comes to the safety of others and myself is not something to be proud of. I, it really, it's really okay to be sensitive, to be oversensitive. You know, I have never, Yulia and I were talking the other day, one of the first times she came here, she was with a group of girlfriends and they were sitting and I noticed that there was a, a young man sort of staring at them quite a bit and I thought, ugh, I'm probably being oversensitive, but I'm, gonna, I'm just gonna go say something to her and make sure she's okay and make sure she's comfortable. And I went over to her and I said, you know, I see what's happening. I see that there's a man sitting over there looking at you for what I feel like is a little too long. Are you okay? And it turned out to be nothing. It turned out that the man actually recognized her and knew her from somewhere else and I think like couldn't remember her name and was trying to recall it so it wasn't awkward. Um, but but it, it turned out to be a beautiful thing that I was oversensitive, not oversensitive, that I was appropriately sensitive to her safety and her comfort level, and a really beautiful friendship developed out of that. And she and her girlfriends knew that they could come here, and no matter how small it was, we were gonna take care of them, and they were safe. David um, created an amazing sign that sits by our register. Is that the, yeah. is this gonna? I, this way? Yeah, there you go. Pass your photo, we'll be right there. Sorry guys. Right there, next. No, nope. okay, so this is the sign. It looks like this. And it says, we want you to have a good night out. If something or someone makes you feel uncomfortable, no matter how minor it seems, you can report it to any member of our staff and they will work with you to make sure it doesn't have to ruin your night. And one thing that I think is important to realize is very rarely is someone knocked over the head and dragged out of the room or out of a space. That is not how these things start. It starts with someone, you know, having an awkward conversation or a look that's too long or hurt feelings or or someone offers to buy you a drink and, and, you, and you say no and, and their ego is damaged, right? This is not zero to 100. It's a slow boil. And if you can find a way to, to, to resolve the issue before it gets too big, hopefully you can avoid that other part. But I tell you what, it makes such a difference if someone else is there with you. And yeah, this is our home, right? This is my home, I live here, we live here, and, and, it, and it's a little different for me in this being my domain, but the reality is anywhere you are is your home. If you are there right then in your body, that is your home. And I don't think any of us would ever allow someone to disrespect or assault or harm someone else in our home. And that's really how I move through the world now Everywhere that I am, that right then is my dwelling. 
I was looking at um, sort of statistics about you know alcohol and and violence obviously that's pertinent for us with the wine aspect and there wasn't a lot it's not something that's been focused on so all I can tell you in terms of nightlife and moving safe through that world is what we do here um, alcohol with these things does does play an ugly role often you know it creates a lack of thoughtfulness and proactivity and so, you know, some of the things that we do here that, that we take really seriously and David takes really seriously is how alcohol is consumed. Our, um, our wines are pretty low in ABV and in, in the alcohol beverage per volume. And, you know, our events end pretty early. It's normally 11. If it's a special event, it's 12. You know, the hours that people spend drinking, things quickly, quickly, de you know, degrade in terms of experience and, and behavior. And we really want behavior here that, that's appropriate. So those are some of the things we do. And we also have the kombucha, right? And kombucha is very, very, very low alcohol. It's about the same as a, a glass of orange juice sitting on a counter for 10 minutes. And most months, our kombucha sales and our, our wine sales are pretty even. Our wine and beer sales are pretty even. And I think it makes a difference. People come here and they have a really magical evening. And and I also get comments about you know, how great they felt the next morning and that they were able to be good parents and good friends and function, which is fabulous, right? And I'm happy about that part for the next morning, but what makes me happiest is the safety aspect, that everyone gets to feel safe and warm and comfortable. Um, so, you know, I also looked up not only that aspect, but I wanted to see, because obviously I don't have hardly any of the answers for this, what is going on in the rest of the world and in this country to make people feel safe. So I googled how to make women safe. The first four hits were how to make a woman feel safe emotionally in a relationship, how to make her feel comfortable so she's a better partner. I mean, and it went on and on and on, and then there were like four pages about India and the extraordinary violence that occurs against women there. And then I gave up. So, you know, the, this was really disheartening at first because I thought, what, what is going on to make women feel safe? Yeah, there's harsher penalties that they're trying to, to enact and, and we talk about public transportation, but the reality is, and this is my personal experience, what's really gonna make us safe is each other for all of us to be aware. You know, I've never, I mean, I think we've all done this. I don't think it's just me. Seen, seen another human being be uncomfortable or perhaps treated in a way that didn't resonate with us and ignored it and thought to ourselves, geez, I'm so glad that I left that person to chance. I'm so glad I didn't say something. I'm so glad I didn't stick my neck out. I personally am so grateful and owe people, you know, perhaps my life, to be honest. Because they acted on that. Because they acted on the fact that where I was right then was their home. That was their dwelling. And I was going to be treated as such. Um, you know, so that's sort of what I wanted to talk about with anxiety here. Um, we move through the world anxious and scared and freaked out. It's a, it's a terrifying place. And the very best thing we can do to relieve that anxiety and create a community and a culture is be there for each other and stick our neck out and take a risk. You know, it is okay to have a thin skin and to make sure that the people around us are safe and to make sure that the places we go, everyone is aware that you're looking out for them. If you see someone, anyone, that looks like they may be possibly in an uncomfortable situation, I promise you, I promise you, if you go and check in with them, they will not be unhappy. There has never been a time in my life where someone came to me and said, hey, are you okay? Is this okay? where I thought anything other than, I am so grateful. Um, and I just, I, you know, I've been listening to, 
David Bowie's David Bowie a lot lately and and the only thing that I can say and the thing that I'm going to leave you with is his fabulous fabulous line we can all be heroes if just for one day thanks Thank you.